What were our biggest takeaways from the 2023 NFL draft? All that and more in this episode of Locked On Cowboys Podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast locked Network, your on. team locked every on. day. Locked On. Locked, locked, locked On. Locked on Cowboys. Welcome back to the Locked on Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. I am your host, Marcus Mosier. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosier. Joining me today, as always, is Lana McCool. You can check him out on Twitter at McCoolBCB. Lana, the draft has wrapped up. Uh, time to breathe and assess this class a little bit, but let's just jump right into this. What was your biggest takeaway from the 2023 NFL draft? Uh, that the times they are a changing. Uh, th- that's, that's the biggest thing I got, honestly, like from a kind of a 10,000 foot view is that the Cowboys are approaching a variety of different positions and, uh, and really the draft overall, it feels like in a lot of ways in, in a different manner than they have previously. Um, it starts with taking the first true defensive tackle. I mean, you call Mark Spears what you want. Uh, uh, he, was the first, he was an end. Uh, you call you call uh, the first defensive tackle they drafted in 30 years. I think that's that shows you that combined with all these other things that we pointed out along the way, right? The the looking at smaller wide receivers, the the the, the kind of change in profiles. That they drafted a five five uh, running back. It's yeah. goodness sakes. So I think that that's my biggest kind of takeaway about the Cowboys, you know, outside of the actual individual picks is that things are really shifting inside that building and, and what they're looking for and what they're doing. And I, I think the other thing I keep, I, I keep mentioning to you is that I think it's time that we stop believing things that are coming out of the building. I, I, I think that the Cowboys have gotten too good at smoke screening uh, and, and the, the difference between what we saw uh, in in the how things lined up before and after the draft with the Garrett administration versus what we've seen in the McCarthy administration uh, has been stark, and I think yeah. it's 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 time for us to stop uh, doing two things: one, believing them, <laughs> and two, ruling a bunch of players out because they don't think they fit what the Cowboys want. I, I think the Cowboys considered a lot wider net than what we're considering at this point. So that's what I'm adjusting. Yeah, I mean, my biggest takeaway was that second point that you made, like. We can't believe anything from anyone going into this draft because let's just look at some of the pre-draft rumors, right? One of them that was we talked about a lot was the Cowboys really like Steve Avila and he yeah. was going to be an option for them at 26. Not only was he not an option at 26, the Cowboys had a fourth round grade on him. So who knows where they even would have taken him, right? Uh, let's go to tight end. We heard pre-draft. Hey, Michael Mayer, not getting past the Cowboys at 26. Dalton Kincaid, top tight end in the class for them. Both those things ended up not being true. That yeah. Sam Laporta, according to Todd Archer, was the Cowboys' number one tight end. Then it was Dalton Kincaid, and then it was Michael Mayer. But none of those guys had first-round grades. And even if Dalton Kincaid would have been available for the Cowboys at 26, they weren't going to make that pick anyway. So, man, you just go through all these rumors. Cowboys are absolutely drafting a quarterback in this year's class. Nope, uh, they're not. It's wild, uh, absolutely wild. Yeah, and and again, like some of it, it's you know ha- having to determine did things just not fall the way they want. But some of it, like it's it's very clear that we were fed not truths. Yeah. And, and so uh, you know, look, we will continue to report it obviously as we get this information. But I think it, it's time for Cowboys fans to t- take a he- healthy dose of salt. With, uh, yes. with with everything that they hear out of this administration at this point. Um, all right, we're going to give some more of our biggest takeaways from this year's draft, but just a programming note. Landon, you and I are going to take the next couple of weeks to really break down this class. We're not going to just try to fit it all into one show. So if you were hoping for that, you know, us to talk about all these players in the show, we're not going to do that today. But over the course of the next couple of days, we'll talk about all these players, including the UDFAs that the Cowboys signed. Yeah. Because we want to do a deep dive into each one of these prospects and how they're going to fit into the offense or defense. Um, So make sure you guys are tuning in for that. What's another takeaway that you have from this year's class? 
Well, I think you know the thing that we have to kind of discuss is what how, how this new offensive backfield is kind of taking shape, right? Like, obviously, we knew the Cowboys were going to be interested in taking a running back. The way the draft just fell, and and we could, we're going to talk about all this, but I, I think you know the kind of takeaway that I took from this is that the Cowboys had to wait a little bit later than they wanted to to get a running back. Uh, I think they're thrilled with the guy they got. Obviously, Deuce Vaughn is is one of the more uh, exciting picks that the Cowboys made for a uh, multitude of reasons. But um, I, I think that that clearly getting a running back that late and, and, and considering who it is, I, I think you look at that and then the fact that later, and obviously this is not going to be the last time I talk about this, the fact that they were able to sign Hunter Lipke into the, uh, the yeah. drafted free agents. I, to me, that re- – and look, they gave Hunter Lipke a lot of money for an undrafted free agent. To me, that reads like he is probably going to make the roster. And, and and if he makes the roster, he's probably going to make a game day roster. I wouldn't be surprised if your new backfield was kind of a three-way, three-headed monster as opposed to a true split. I, I think if you if you were talking about drafting a Charbonnet or if you're talking about drafting a Kendry Miller or some of the other guys that we had kind of gone over in that sort of third and fourth round – you're talking about maybe a true split with with a guy that would kind of come in and yep. and relieve things. I think now that you've got considering who it is that you took, Deuce Vaughn and Pollard, you, you need a third back to be uh, kind of mixed in there. And I think with a guy like Lipke, you've got someone who could also play fullback for you. So I think that that's one thing I took away is that it seems to me that they uh, have got a plan at running back, but it may not be a, a, a splitting situation. It may be more of a three-headed committee sort of situation. Yep. Uh, and I think with Lepke, he could potentially be their short yardage running back, yep. right? And if yep, you have, totally. let's just assume it's Tony Pollard and Deuce Vaughn as your running backs. Neither of those guys are great short yardage running backs. You mm-hmm. you let Lepke do it. You keep him on the field. You let him do a bunch of special team stuff. And it's not hard to envision him playing – 35 total snaps in a game between special teams and offense. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy who, who's going to be a four, you know, four bag special team where he's going to play on all of them for you. Yeah. Uh, and this is what you need from a third running back. Right. So yes. I, I think, I think Lipke makes a lot of sense uh, with the fit of the, of the rest of the backfield. So that's something I just kind of wanted to point out as a yep. whole. I, I've got one big takeaway that I just learned from this draft. Uh, we're going to get to that one next. This episode is brought to you by built bar. Are you looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar in the calories? Then you need to try the best tasting protein bar ever. It's built. You guys have to try it by now. If you haven't tried it by now, you're missing out. Let me just say that. It's healthy. They taste amazing. Plus, they come in so many great flavors, including churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. The best part is it's covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right. Real chocolate. And... Only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, but a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't even have to wait to get a box. You can still go to built.com, order your boxes over there. But if you need your built fix, run into Walmart, go to the pharmacy section, pick up a four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or the coconut puff. And if you live close to a Sam's Club, you can run in, you can grab a 13 bar box with some of the hit flavors, including brownie batter puff and churro puff, and you can thank us later. Thank you for making Locked on Cowboys your first listen every day. Every day or tomorrow on the show, Lynn and I are going to talk about the Cowboys' second and third round picks, Luke Schoenemaker and Demario Overshawn, so make sure you guys tune into that. All right, Lynn, my biggest takeaway is that the Cowboys are just going to default to taking ridiculously good athletes early in the draft. Like that's just something we've kind of seen trend over the last couple of years. They're willing to take a shot on not finished products. Uh, if they have elite athleticism and that's exactly what this class has. Like Bozzy Smith didn't test uh, before the draft, but we know he was number one on the freaks list. He's, he's an athlete, right? Yeah. Luke Schoenemaker, uh 98th percentile athlete, according to Raz. Uh, Overshawn, 82nd percentile athlete. Eric Scott, believe it or not, tested as an 87th percentile athlete despite yeah. running a 4-7, 40-yard dash. Uh, you plug in a 4-4 there, I think it goes up to 99%. It's just what they're going to be doing from now on. 
Yeah, and, and, and listen, it kind of goes back to kind of the stuff that we had talked about before the draft and and and, and my thoughts about uh, uh, offensive linemen have changed. And I think it's it, it's becoming more and more widespread across all positions is that uh, upside is where the value is. You mm-hmm. know, I, I, I think these players that 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 uh, are coming in with a little bit less developed skill set, but are being put with coaches that understand how to you know hone that and get them up to speed quickly. Uh, it's having a lot of success in the NFL. And you're seeing that a lot of the top end players in the NFL uh, are players who came into the draft or came into the league as viewed as projects as, as upside projects. And, and, you know, there's definitely a, a class of NFL that's near the top. That is, you know, they've been five-star recruits their whole life. They may not be the best athletes, but they're very refined players. There certainly is that. But you see that that top layer of, of NFL uh, talent, and a lot of those guys still haven't completely figured out what they're doing yet, but they're just so good as, well, athletically. That I look at, like, edge rusher, thing. right? Yeah. I believe Micah Parsons, Miles Garrett, uh, Nick Bosa, Max Crosby, all those guys are, like, 95th percentile athletes or better. And it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and it's not even just those positions too, right? It's like you're starting to bet on athleticism in positions where, um, you know, like edge rusher and corner, and those are positions like that you that we've always relied heavily on athleticism, or at least smart folks have. Uh, I think it started to extend out, you know, to other positions that didn't necessarily. I think offensive line is a position sure, that absolutely. you know that yes. a- athleticism is has been a part of it. You know, it's always been a part of it, but there's always been a I'll bet on traits more than athleticism you know, argument. I don't know that that's still the same uh, case anymore. So if you've got a good offensive lineman, a uh, line coach who you trust to develop them, uh, you go get that athlete who can give you that upside and, and, and show you what you, you, you haven't seen on tape yet uh, on the practice field but with just a couple of you know reps and getting used to the techniques that you're, you're- – Well, I, I think tight end is a perfect example for this year, yeah. right? Like I- – no tight end in this class had better tape than Michael Mayer, right? And Mayer tested as a 75th percentile athlete, so well above average. But the Cowboys had Sam Laporta as their number one tight end in this class because he's a Let's phenomenal go. athlete. And I'm going to keep mentioning this on the show. Talk to Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl. And he said, you know, the NFL draft is a crapshoot, right? Just take the best athletes and cross your fingers because nobody else knows whether these guys are going to translate to the NFL or not. So, why not gamble on upside? And it seems like that's what the Cowboys are doing. And it seems like they're making an effort to take really good athletes high. Yeah. I mean, it's the old saying goes, if you're going to make a mistake, make it at a thousand miles an hour. And I guess yep. that's what the Cowboys are interested in doing. Yeah. Uh, any other takeaways from this draft class, maybe as a whole, because I, I will say just looking at this class and uh, looking at the Cowboys rosters, there's just not a lot of spots for players to come in and start. And as you get to be right, right. Right. When you, when you get to have a really good team, it's harder and harder to find starters on day one and day two. But I do think the Cowboys with their first two pick grab guys that are likely to see a lot of snaps as rookies. Well, and I think that's part of the issue I have with the general thought of, well, the Cowboys didn't pick positional players that you know uh that had positional value is like well the cowboys have really good players and good depth at all those positions for the most well take nolan smith for example right because i think that's the guy that listen if you well we'll get to the consensus board in just a second but if you were drafting just based off consensus right i think most people would say take nolan smith look at the edge rushers on their team right now is he playing over Mark, Micah Parsons? Is he playing over Demarcus Lawrence? You drafted Sam Williams in round two last year. You have Doran Armstrong. You have Dante Fowler. Does it really make sense to take another edge rusher that high if you can only get him fifteen snaps a game? I don't think it does. I mean, I, I and listen. I, I understand the idea of drafting uh, uh, for surplus and that you can never have enough of the, some of these players. But I, I, I think that there is. There's not just a uh, a line where that's how do I say this? There, there's a there's a point when it, it, it drafting a six defensive end is not just not as valuable as drafting a nose tackle who's definitely going to play thirty plus snaps a game. You know what I'm saying? Especially like, if you have a weakness at defensive tackle, yeah. the grades are similar, and it seems yeah. like. We don't know for sure, but it seems like the Cowboys had at least similar grades on Mozzie Smith as they did some of the other players that were higher on the consensus board. 
Yeah. So I, I think that, listen, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. You know, there's a lot of different ways to, to get what you want out of this draft. And, and I think that for the Cowboys, uh, they have a very good roster coming into this. They, and they, they look for as much as we've complained about it, they've did the things in the off season pre to the pros before the draft to, to kind of get their roster where they needed to. They made those trades, sure. you know, and it's like if they hadn't traded for Brandon cooks and Stefan Gilmore, then like maybe you talk about drafting a, a wide receiver or a corner or Joey at, Porter, at, at right? Like, yeah, exactly. Spoiler. So, Joey Porter was their last first round grade available, but it didn't necessarily make sense for them to draft Porter at 26 when he wouldn't have been one of your starting outside corners. He doesn't play, play in the spot. slot and he's got no experience playing special teams. So where does that leave your first round pick when you are in a championship window? either on the bench or on the inactive list. And I just don't think the Cowboys were interested in doing that. Yeah. And, and they, they, you, it's going to be hard enough to kind of fit non-special teams down roster players onto this game day roster as it is. So why reach there? I, I think the Cowboys did may, had a very non-sexy draft in a lot of ways, uh, despite what Mike McCarthy says, because they have a very sexy roster already, yeah. you know, like yeah. that's the thing. And I think they were putting finishing touches on this. And look, I can understand how that makes people flash back to 2019. I can understand oh, that. It's so different. It's so this different. is so different. You're drafting starters. You, you drafted several guys who I think will, you have drafted two guys who I feel like are going to be starters. And then there's another two or three players who, I, I think are either going to be contributors and there's undrafted free agents who will, will get snaps in this team. So oh, yeah. they drafted players at positions that are going to be con- maybe small contributors, but the big contributors on this team are pretty well set at this point. Right. And that's the thing is if you take your money, five positions, right? Quarterback, wide receiver, left tackle, edge rusher corners. They already have first round picks or high all pro caliber players at all those positions. Right. So it and makes good backups it, too. Yeah. It, so you go to the next group because there is a drop off, right? I think interior defensive line is on that next tier of the most important positions. They haven't spent high picks there. It was the biggest weakness on the roster and they had a highly graded player available to them at 26. Take it. I, I really think it was that simple. Yeah. And, and we could talk about some of the draft sequencing stuff and we will, I think there was, they, Early on, it felt like they may have made some uh, or what I perceived to be a, a mistake in some of the sequencing, but they were able to kind of come back later in the draft and especially in the undrafted free agency and kind of make up for yeah. a lot of that value. So, uh, yeah, I, I think they had a good draft. I think it's tough. It's tough for a casual fan to get excited about it because it wasn't a lot of flashy names that everybody yep. knows necessarily. But as far as their fit on this team, uh, I think they, they got a lot of really good picks. Last little one before we move on. I don't think the Cowboys are ever going to draft a traditional guard ever again. Osiris Torrance was available to them at pick 58. They yeah. said no. They were considering Matthew Bergeron from Syracuse yeah. in round one, potentially over Mozzie Smith, who was the left tackle at Syracuse. I, I, I don't know. I, like, I, just, I can't see them taking a guard only in the top three rounds for a long, long time. Yeah, if Osiris Torrance wasn't going to do it, then then it probably wasn't happening. At fifty eight, right? Like, right? Yeah, at fifty eight. And look, I mean, again, we go back to what we talked about. He isn't exactly the perfect fit for a team that only is only running, you know, gap schemes like maybe a third of the time. Sure. You know, um, so you're running a mostly zone, and that's not necessarily what his strength is. Clearly, the Cowboys uh, prefer these tackle guard guys. Uh, and, and now, what we're going to see is a uh, a uh, 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 you know, we'll see Adogba, Richards, and Bass, I think, kind of battle it out for seeing if one of them can grab that left guard. If they can't, then you fall, fail over either to Tyler Smith moving aside or potentially going to look at someone like Dalton Reisner to come in. So yeah. I, I think that, that that was another thing that they just felt like, look, we can do this with bodies. There's people on the there's people out on the street. Uh, once they got past a certain point, they didn't, they weren't going to be able to get the tackle guard that they wanted. That gives them the flexibility. They figured they'll find a solution in house. You know, the floor on this situation is very high as long as Tyler Smith can play left guard. Right. So it it will be okay. It'll be okay. If there's one spot on the roster, your starting roster that you haven't figured out in may and it's left guard, 
you'll That's, be okay. Yeah, you'll be all right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about draft grades and consensus boards and value when we get back. All right, Landon. Uh, we've got about five minutes left in the show, and I just, I think you and I both need to rant a little bit about consensus board and draft grades. So first of all, I put together a draft expert consensus board every year that we post on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And people use that to say whether or not you got value or you reached and it's, it's whatever. There is a lot of echo chamber stuff that goes in with these draft expert grades, especially when you do like the uh, industry board, which I've seen a lot, which is like the combination of 300 boards. A lot of people who are, ranking people just based on where they see them on other boards. And that's why they end up getting boosted. It's, it's just not a great way to judge a draft class. I'm just going to, just going to leave it there. Oh well, yeah. I mean, especially for look, it, 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 it's all about what are you trying to do? Like if you're trying to figure out generally where a player can go before the draft consensus board is great. Like, it, I mean, it just kind of helps you generally context contextualize the stock of this player universally but but the thing we have to remember is that these consensus boards never ever include nfl teams the Mm -hmm. actual people that are doing the work and 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 again like what are we trying to do here are you trying to find out universally you know between both the nfl teams and media scouts what what a stock what the stock is of a player because that's frankly useless it does not matter what the media folk actually think about these players. I mean, again, it helps us get an idea of who these players are. Yep. But ultimately what matters is the t- the people that are spending millions and millions of dollars hiring detectives to follow these guys, like watching uh, crazy amounts of tape of, on, on all these guys. That's what matters. Look, look judging what happens uh, in the NFL draft the day after the NFL draft based on a cobbled together board of non-expert non-team specific opinions is uh, in my opinion Mm -hmm. is just poor process like it's just not a great way to judge how a team did with inside the context of their own team by comparing it to a non-team specific non-expert version of what a, a whole bunch of people thought. Is it better than just taking one mock draft and comparing it to a mock draft? Yes, infinitely yeah. better. But there's still scales to these things. Sure. This is still not even a third of the way as good as, like, I don't know, having insight into what an actual NFL team thinks. Like, that. that's yes. this is just not the same sort of value. It's not that sort of tool. We need to stop holding it to that kind of standard. Like, it's yes. the end-all, be-all. It's just not. And also want to put this in perspective the consensus board has been really bad versus the Cowboys track record. For example, here are four players, the four highest graded players that the Cowboys have selected that were basically positive values on the consensus board since 2019. It's Neville Gallimore, Connor (laughs) McGovern, Bradley and I, and Jalen Tolbert. Those are the four players that the consensus board said the Cowboys got excellent value on. Here's the opposite. Nation Wright, I think they got that one right. Okay, that's a miss by the Cowboys. Oso Digizua, Tyler Smith, and Tony Pollard. And uh, honestly, I'll even go on the Nation right. I, they they still were wrong because if you go back and look at how, they had Nation right like not ranked three twenty one is what I saw. Nation right has been okay, and 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 and, and being the three hundred twenty first like ranked player doesn't mean that you're just okay on an NFL team. You know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah. He, he look. He hasn't been a starter, but like the fact that he's been you get hit that the guy mix, the fifth sixth round. It's it's great pick, right? Because you made exactly. It so yeah. like yeah, I, I, that's I, I think that that just shows you like the consensus boards. Again, they're not they're not even measuring it on how a player would fit inside a specific organization. So how could you possibly ever get a good feel for what a player's value is to a team that has a specific point of view? I, that's the that's my issue with it. It's 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 a clever way to, you know, kind of. I, I think it does get a good the job average of, of all our thoughts, right? And right? I think it does a good job of giving you the list of players that are going to be drafted, usually in around in the right spots. Sure. Like for example, sure. Luke Schoonmaker, I think was seventy fifth on the consensus board. He went fifty eight. Is that technically overdrafting him? Sure, but when you're talking about sixteen spots in the 
bottom of the second round, you're talking about a half round. It's like, a, it's not a big deal, right? Same with Mozzie Smith. I think Mozzie Smith was 35th on the consensus board. He went 26. That's not a big enough gap to get upset about, right? And it just, I don't know, man. I, I've seen so many people say the Cowboys have had bad drafts because of the consensus board and stuff, but that's just, it's such a bad way to evaluate prospects and team fits. Especially since the Cowboys have been like way better than the league average at drafting. Like yes. the fact that you can't give them a kind of a benefit of a doubt on some of this stuff, especially when it's not like glaringly bad. Well, like, and I think like, like, yeah, the difference is like the Raiders back in 2019 when they took Cleveland Farrell at four, yeah. and he was ranked <laughs> like 28th on consensus board. That's when you're at that high in the draft, 22 spots makes a difference. When you're in the third round, it doesn't matter at all. You know? Yeah. Look, that was the other thing we talked about, right? Like probably after player 15 to 65, maybe there's a, just there's a plateau of players. It's all just about what you think you want and yes. what fits. So getting pissed off because I would have taken Schoonamaker 15 picks later. Who cares? Man? You didn't have like, a pick 15 picks later, yeah, right? It was, it's... and that's, that's the other thing that the consensus board doesn't factor in is runs on positions, which yeah. absolutely happened. Go look at the tight ends that were available to the Cowboys at pick 90. It was Darnell Washington, who it seems like the Cowboys flunked medically. And that was it, right? Like there, there was nobody available. So while I, ideally you would have liked to take him at pick 71, he wouldn't have been there at 90. So what difference does it make? Yeah, I, I agree. He, you know, he's the last of those kind of starting level tight ends that or, or tight ends worth having in the first two rounds. You got him. At least you got one of those tight ends. And and frankly, as much as well, we'll get into all these guys individually, but I, I just think that there's a lot of nitpicking when the Cowboys managed to hit uh, the positions that they needed to hit, got value, got decent value, not, you know, look, not necessarily a versus a consensus board, perfect value, but they got good, good value for each one of them. And then, you know, we're going to suss it out and see how it all plays out in training camp. But, you know, this is also why I hate draft grades. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing, guys? Like, how do you how do you even know? <laughs> like, how I, do you, we don't I have hate, the answers yet. How do you grade a test without the answers? Like, yeah, I hate draft grades, too. But Mel Kuyper gave the Cowboys a B like that. <laughs> he liked the Cowboys draft quite a bit. So I, yeah, just say you like it, Mel. Don't give me a letter. <laughs> You know, that's fine. Exactly. Just dr tell me the process. Did you like the process the Cowboys yeah. had? Do you like that they yeah. filled certain needs? Did you like the trade downs? Did you like the trades up? That to me, that matters way more than the player valuation because you're only going to give teams good grades if you like those players or not, and that can be very, very subjective. So that's very, very true. That's this sounds like two old guys telling you to get off our lawns, right? Uh, it's, we're getting right. We're getting. That's all right. There. We're getting. Yeah. Old. Uh, all right. That is it for today's show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Tomorrow, we'll be back to break down Luke Schoonemaker, tomorrow we'll be over Sean, uh, and then the rest of the week, we're going to talk about the day three selections. We'll get into the UDFAs. We've got a oh, lot yeah. of content coming up, so make sure you guys are subscribed to the Locked on Cowboys podcast. Check us out on YouTube, Locked on Cowboys over there. You can follow Landon on Twitter, at McCoolBCB. I'm at Marcus underscore Mosier, and we'll see you ne uh, next time.